I'm Buse, one of the Science and the News Lecture Series coordinators. We're very happy to see all of you here. Um, it's a lecture series that used to be in person. Now we're doing it virtually, which allows us to go all over the place, which is very nice. So Science in the News is an organization. It's a grad student organization at Harvard. And the goal of it is to have graduate students share their science work with the general public, both to help them develop science communications and also just to, um, just to get to share their audience than just the scientific community. Um, there's different, many, many different initiatives. I'll post a really uh, quick link in the chat if you want to check out Science in the News's other things. Um, we have a blog that's updated very, very quickly. Our next series lecture will be on December 2nd. Um, it'll be on vaccines and COVID, so very related things. So you should think about attending that. Um, yeah, so that's Science in the News. So I'll just talk a little bit about the format of today. Um, it'll be in three parts. So Molly's going to give us a lecture that's three parts. You can keep asking questions in the chat throughout. Um, and then we can we will relay them to Molly at the end of each section. Um, you can also, uh, like once, you, once we get into the break, you can ask your questions in person as well. So we can uh, let you speak, let you unmute yourself and speak as well. Um, we have both YouTube and Zoom happening at the same time. So we'll relay questions in, from both of them. If Zoom becomes challenging for you for some reason, you should feel free to just go to YouTube. I'll post the uh, link of the YouTube in the chat as well, in case you have technical issues because YouTube can sometimes be smoother than Zoom. But that's pretty much it for our uh, logistics. If you have any questions, you can see my name. It says Science in the News, SITN moderator Busa. Feel free to chat me if you have any issues and I'll be happy to help you. But we're very excited to learn about antibiotics today. So Molly Sargent today is gonna talk about antibiotics from cures to crisis. And I'll let her further introduce herself and then get us started. Hi everyone, so welcome to tonight's talk. I'm really excited to share um, some back, some information about antibiotics with you. Like Buza said, the title of the talk is Antibiotics and how they were miraculous cures and are now somewhat of a crisis. So my name is Molly Sargent and I am a PhD student in the Biological and Biomedical Sciences program at Harvard Medical School. A little bit of background um, for me is that I graduated from Penn State in 2019 with a degree in biochemistry and molecular biology. During my time at Penn State, I started doing research and I really fell in love with bacteria and microbiology. So now I'm a PhD student at the Biological and Biomedical Sciences program. And this here on the right is a picture of all of my classmates who are also doing PhDs. And we're all studying all kinds of different things, but my favorite topic is bacteria and that's what I'm going to study. So here's a little bit about my research. Um, I am a member of the Helene Lab in the microbiology department, and we study salmonella that survive within human immune cells called macrophages. We're especially interested in how a subpopulation of salmonella can survive antibiotics during in, antibiotic treatment during infection while they're within these macrophages. So this topic of tonight's uh, talk is really uh, one of the drivers behind some of the research that I am doing. So an outline for what we're gonna to cover tonight is first a background on antibiotics. Uh, what are antibiotics and what does it mean for there to be antibiotic resistance? Then we'll move into part two, which will be a history of the antibiotic resistance crisis. So how we discovered antibiotics and began to use them and why we are now facing a crisis. And finally, we'll discuss the future of antibiotics and what that might look like um, with different changes we can make. So as a background, uh, we all kind of need to know what antibiotics are. So I'm gonna begin by defining antibiotics as I'll discuss them tonight. An antibiotic is a substance that kills or inhibits microorganisms and it's derived from anti meaning against and bio meaning life. So basically an antibiotic is something that's against life and specifically we use it to refer to something that is against the life of microorganisms. Some other terms that might be used to refer to antibiotics are antimicrobial, antifungal, or antibacterial. They all kind of refer to the same idea, and I think it's important to be aware of them, but they're not necessarily um, terms I'm going to use tonight. So given that my definition of antibiotic includes microorganism, I also want to define what are microorganisms. Microorganisms are precisely defined as microscopic organisms 
or basically just small living things, things so small that you need a microscope to see them. They're typically only made of one or a few cells. Um, and for comparison, the human body is made of trillions of cells. So microorganisms come in all kinds of shapes and sizes and types, including fungi, bacteria, and protozoan. There are a few uh, examples that you might be familiar with. So E. coli, you've probably heard of, um, and salmonella, staph aureus, and mycobacter mycobacterium tuberculosis are all pretty important pathogens. They cause food poisoning, skin, skin infections, or lung infections, depending on the way an individual is infected with them or um, which bacteria are currently present. These here are all bacteria, but I do wanna remind you that microbes are also fungi, protozoans, and um, there's many, many types. So now let's start with part one, a background on antibiotics. In this section, we're gonna cover what are antibiotics, how do antibiotics work, and what is antibiotic resistance? So how do antibiotics work? Antibiotics block processes that microbes need to survive. When these processes are blocked, the microbes die, as you see here in this little cartoon. And I want to describe a little bit about how specifically this works. A common feature of a lot of microbes is a cell wall. That's this outer structure that's surrounding the uh, bacteria pictured here. So if we zoom in a little bit, you can see that there's an inner compartment that's containing everything the cell or microbe needs to survive. And then the outer layer of wall and membranes is protecting the um, microbe. It's keeping everything that needs to stay inside the cell inside and keeping most harmful things out and just allowing the cell to have a defined unit of function. So antibiotics can damage the cell wall. If we look on the, right, on the left, that's a zoomed out version of the picture I was showing previously. This is an intact cell completely protected by its cell wall. When an antibiotic is added and the cell wall is damaged, cells will undergo what we call lysis. And this is basically a hole or multiple holes forming the cell wall such that the cell bursts open and everything that needed to be on the inside is released and lots of harmful things can get in. This is lethal for the cells. I think it's especially interesting to see what this looks like for real. So I wanna show you a video of what an antibiotic can do to the cell wall. Here we have some bacterium that are initially intact, just like the picture on the left. And now we've added some antibiotic and it, you can just envision that floating around in the solution here. It's really small, so you can't see it, but there's all kinds of antibiotic molecules floating around these bacteria. As you watch, you can tell that the bacteria are damaged by the antibiotic and they're undergoing lysis. As the shapes become light, that means that the cell has burst open and you can physically see everything inside the cell bursting out. So that's just one more microbes and be lethal. Another way could be by inhibiting growth. So I'll describe a little bit about how microbes grow. Microbes grow by dividing. You start with one cell, the cell increases in size a little bit, and then it divides to split into two cells. So instead of growth, meaning just to get bigger, growth for microbes means to multiply and replicate. And this growth occurs pretty rapidly, as I'll show you in this video here. These are some E. coli cells. And they start out with just single, like the top of this picture, and they begin to replicate rapidly until they cover the entire slide. Antibiotics can interfere with this uh, division process and uh, inhibit the cell from dividing once it becomes elongated. So instead of splitting into two cells, you just see a continued increase in size, which I also have a video here. And this increase in size isn't really um, useful for the cells. They really need to divide in order to contain the proper amounts of everything that they need to survive. 
So when they become really long, they also eventually lyse. And so inhibiting division can be just as lethal as directly damaging the cell. Aside from affecting the cell wall, uh, we can also affect other processes that are required for survival uh, with antibiotics. So some processes are specifically required for survival. Let's consider that in order to survive, the cell really needs this broken apart orange molecule here on the right. If this process is completed and this singular, the large orange molecule is broken into two, the cell can survive. If the process fails and the large orange molecule is never broken apart, the cell would die. In order to ensure that all these processes happen, cells have special machines that take care of breaking down all those or large orange molecules to break them into two pieces. And so in this instance, the cellular machine is breaking down the molecule and the cell survives. If we add an antibiotic, oops, if we add an antibiotic, the antibiotic could block the function of the machine and therefore the orange molecule can no longer be broken down and the cell would die. So this is just one way that we can use an antibiotic to inhibit an essential process and lead to cell death. It's important to note that antibiotics affect all kinds of microorganisms differently, depending on the types of cell walls that they have or the specific machines. If an antibiotic targets only a few microbes, we refer to it as narrow spectrum. While if an antibiotic targets multiple types of microbes, we refer to it as broad spectrum. On this note, I also wanna point out that antibiotics do not affect human cells and viruses. Just like they affect microbial cells differently, depending on the different types of cell walls or molecular machines that they contain. Human cells and viruses contain extremely different versions of all the molecular machines and structures so that antibiotics do not affect our cells. So next we're gonna cover a little bit of what we use antibiotics for. We use antibiotics for a lot more purposes than you might uh, realize. You might be familiar with using antibiotics to treat infections. However, we also use antibiotics to prevent infections during invasive medical procedures. If you think about how much your skin is protecting you and uh, keeping a lot of harmful microbes uh, that are just everywhere in the environment out of your body, when you've performed a surgery and you've now exposed uh, your uh, internal organs to microbes that they typically aren't exposed to, and this is a really easy way for infections to occur. So sometimes we preventatively give antibiotics before invasive medical procedures. Antibiotics are also used to promote the growth of livestock. It's not really clear why this works, but aside from preventing infections in animals, we do notice that there's an effect of increased growth when animals are treated with antibiotics. Lastly, we also use antibiotics to protect our crops. Just like human and animal cells can become infected, uh, crops and plants can also be infected by various microbes. So sometimes they're also treated with antibiotics. In all the ways that we're using antibiotics, we're really depending on them being effective or the microbes being what we call susceptible. So let's define what susceptible means. Antibiotic susceptibility means the ability of a microorganism to be killed or inhibited by an antibiotic. On the other hand, we can have microbes that are resistant. And this refers to the ability of a microorganism to escape the effects of an antibiotic. In other words, if a microbe is susceptible, when treated with an antibiotic, the microbe dies. This is depicted in green because this is typically what we're trying to do, so it's good for us. On the other hand, if a resistant microbe is treated with an antibiotic, the resistant microbe will not die or rather survive. And this is red because it's usually not what we'd want to happen. So how exactly uh, does this resistance develop? Resistance develops through something we call selective pressure. Selective pressure is a selection for specific features that enable survival in an environment. In a given environment, this really means that only the organisms that are best suited for survival can survive. You, think, you can think about this kind of like sports tryouts you have a bunch of players together and you pick only the ones that are the best at the sport you're trying to uh, make a team for. And at the end, the final team is, as, is best suited to play that sport. In the case of microbes, we might start with a population of bacteria or microbes that are susceptible. And 
it's a, there might be some variations in these uh, microorganisms. So when they're treated with antibiotics, one of them that has a specific variation might be resistant. All of these green bacteria with the pink antibiotics are susceptible, while this pink one is resistant. And the pink microbe that's resistant is now able to grow even in the face of the, the antibiotics, such that the pink resistant microorganism takes over the entire population. So next I wanna show a video of what this resistance development can really look like. Um, and it's depicted by the Bain lab here at Harvard Medical School. They're gonna describe what it looks like when bacteria progressively become resistant to higher concentrations of antibiotics. As a background, um, they're going to discuss the bacteria growing on a surface called agar. This is just a surface a media for the bacteria to grow on. What's really interesting is to see what happens. So here is their giant uh, setup of agarose. They have all these different bands and they've put um, different concentrations of antibiotic in each of these bands. You can see here, they're starting to show. They have no antibiotic at the first location. And then at each progressive band, there's 10 times more antibiotic. So typically we would expect that bacteria can no longer grow uh, once they reach each of these concentrations. So the idea is they're gonna put a lot of microbes here in this first place where there's no antibiotic. And you can see that the microbes are able to grow really well. Just like in the video of the division, you, microscopically in this band, they're dividing uh, really quickly until they reach the, the location of the antibiotic. From the location of the antibiotic, it takes a little bit of time, but eventually one of the microbes, like the pink one, finds a variation that allows it to grow in the face of this antibiotic. And then progressively, they begin to repeat this process over and over at each barrier of reaching, at the, as the microbes are reaching the middle here, that middle has 1,000 times the concentration of antibiotic that's typically able to kill the microorganism. And lastly, they're just showing all the different types of variations that arose over the course of this, ex over the course of this experiment. They started with one type of microbe, and then as spontaneous uh, variations arose, they were able to um, have lots of different resistances. So seeing things like this makes a lot of scientists wonder how do bacteria become resistant to antibiotics? So here on the left, there is a bacterium and it's been treated with all these little pink antibiotic molecules like I've shown before. And there are specific ways at the molecular level that this microbe might become resistant. This is referring to the kinds of changes that might have happened in that original resistant bacterium uh, in the slide I showed previously. So first, let's uh, get a frame for this picture. Uh, just as shown before, this outer dark layer is the cell wall or cell membrane, and the inner layer closer to the bottom right of the screen would be all the protected inner compartment that contains everything the cell needs to survive. So first, a bacteria might become resistant to an antibiotic by blocking its entry it might be able to change its cell wall a little bit so that the antibiotic can no longer pass through. Secondly, if an antibiotic is specifically targeting a specific molecular machine, the cell might come up with a way to modify this uh, molecular machine a little bit such that the antibiotic molecule can no longer bind it. So in this case, the molecular machine would still be able to perform the required process and would, be not, would not be affected by the antibiotic. And then the cell would be able to survive. The cell might also find a way to destroy antibiotics. Sometimes it makes special machines to do this, or sometimes it repurposes machines that it already has to break down the antibiotics and so they can no longer affect their targets. And lastly, the cell can come up with a way to pump antibiotics out of the cell. So if those antibiotics are not in the cell, they can no longer affect the survival. So in summary of part one, antibiotics are chemicals that kill microbes by blocking important processes. Humans use antibiotics in medicine, agriculture, and other industries, and microbes develop resistance to antibiotics by finding ways to escape the effects of the antibiotics. So now I'll take some questions for part one. I'll read it, it's in the chat. E. coli contamination of food, such as in the case of several years ago with Wendy's, makes the news with people dying from food poisoning. What is unique about these strains since we have E. coli in our gut already? Do these strains, which cause food poisoning in humans, produce different toxins to which people are susceptible? 
That's a really good question. And uh, the toxins is a pretty good uh, explanation for it. So there are, like I mentioned, millions and millions of different kinds of bacteria. And so E. coli is one broad class of bacteria and we call that a species, but there's also many, many different strains that are variations of that species. So a lot of E. coli does not produce toxins and those would be the kind that are typically in our gut. But then we also know of E. coli that do produce really harmful toxins and those would be the ones that are associated with food poisoning. The E. coli in our own guts can make us sick too, right? If they leave the gut and spread to other parts of the body through a tear in the gut or during surgery or something. In that case, does E. coli just make us sick, sick by taking up space and resources in our body? So I guess it's two questions. One, is the problem E. coli not being in the gut? And two, does it just make, up, make us sick by taking up resources? Yeah, so the ability of microorganisms like E. coli to live in our gut is really something that is um, kind of a well-defined or developed process. So they're kind of they have a specific niche where they can live inside our gut, but if they do escape outside of that, they can make you sick because they're not, um, the body is not accustomed to them being there. And so it's almost sometimes the immune response that's more damaging than the actual bacteria being somewhere that it's not supposed to be. And uh, the inflammatory response to that can be really damaging. Thank you. And they say thank you too <laughs> for your answer. So if anybody has any other parting questions, if not, we're, we'll start section two. Any clarification or questions you have based on what Molly's talked so far? Going once, going twice. All right, let's start section two then. All right, so moving into section two, part two is going to be about the history of the antibiotic crisis. So the antibiotic history of the antibiotic resistance crisis is going to cover how were antibiotics discovered and how has antibiotic resistance become a crisis. So I'm going to start all the way back at the early or early 1900s. The idea of substances like antibiotics came before the 1900s, but Paul Ehrlich in the early 1900s was really the first to define a quest for such a substance. He had this idea that there would be a substance that would work like a magic bullet and would specifically affect microorganisms or things causing disease without harming the infected person. So he spent a lot of time looking for such a magic bullet and he did find a drug called Salversan that we uh, refer to as a really early antibiotic and it could treat syphilis but it wasn't quite his magic bullet because there were some pretty severe side effects. Nonetheless his idea and the su marginal success that he had with it really inspired some other scientists. In 1928, a scientist named Alexander Fleming found what we call the first antibiotic or found penicillin. So Fleming was a scientist in the United Kingdom and he was a microbiologist. And his discovery of penicillin began with a stack of plates or Petri dishes like you see here uh, with the arrow. So in the lab, bacteriologists use these Petri dishes to manipulate and store our bacteria. We put some gelatin, uh, a gelatin solution with some media into the Petri dish and let it solidify. And then we put a certain number of bacteria down on it. And as I talked about before, the bacteria growing by replicating, that's what the bacteria do on this plate as they can eat the nutrients within it. And as they replicate, they form what we call a bacterial colony. So every one of these white spots is a bacterial colony and basically contains millions and millions of bacteria, starting from one that has replicated. So Fleming, this is a really old technique, and Fleming was doing this all the way back in 1928. And he one day found a plate that looked like this. So you might notice that this plate doesn't quite look like the one on the left. There are a few differences. First, there's a huge white looking colony here that really doesn't look like the rest of the colonies. And that's because it isn't like the rest of the colonies. While all of the other colonies are made by bacteria, this here is made by a mold or a fungus called penicillium. And Fleming also noticed that all of what were bacterial colonies surrounding this mold spot are really small. So if you compare the colonies that are close to the mold with the red arrows to the colonies that are far away from the mold, shown with the green arrows, 
The ones really close to the mold are really small. They look like they're dying and unhealthy, while the ones really far away look healthy and just like the ones on the plate that doesn't have mold. So Fleming looking at this thought, there must be something that the mold is producing that's preventing the, the colonies close to it, from the bacteria close to it from growing. And he was able to identify and purify the substance and named it penicillin after the mold. So knowing that this mold, which is a microbe, produces antibiotics that inhibit the growth of the bacteria, it raises the question, why would a microbe produce antibiotics? Well, an important concept is that microbes are all growing together in a mix or community in any environment. So like we mentioned in our gut, there are not just E. coli, but there's hundreds of other types of bacteria in our gut. There's hundreds of other types of bacteria in every environment you can imagine. And that's depicted here by the, the microbes with all the different shapes here. So when they're in these environments together, they're all competing for the same resources. They all want to grow or replicate as much as possible. And so they all need to consume the same, the, as much nutrients as possible. And that's limited by the number of other microbes that are around it. Sometimes one microbe will begin to produce an antibiotic to inhibit the growth of the others and allow it to compete. So if we see here, the pink bacterium is producing the pink antibiotic molecule. That pink antibiotic molecule inhibits the growth of all of the other microbes. And now the pink bacterium is able to replicate and consume all of the nu nutrients. So it becomes dominant member of the population. So therefore inhibiting the growth of the competitors is really a benefit to a microbe and one reason why they might produce antibiotics. So back to our story of penicillin, early antibiotic production was uh, very different from what we did now. It took a long time to figure out how we could purify enough penicillin to use it as an, a true antibiotic to treat infections in humans. Two people who were really instrumental in this were Howard Florey and Ernst Chain, who did win a Nobel Prize for doing this. They spent a lot of time in laboratories in both the US and the UK trying to find ways to purify penicillin and were instrumental in treating the first patient with penicillin. The first patient they treated was a policeman named Albert Alexander in Oxford, and he had developed a really lethal infection from just a small cut while gardening. They were able to use penicillin to begin to cure him. However, they ran out of penicillin before he could completely um, be cured. Nonetheless, this early success really motivated them to find further ways, and we began to develop larger scale antibiotic production, um, such as you see here on the right, which is a really early factory of how they produce antibiotics in large uh, culture flasks. It's a lot different from what it looks like today, but the beginnings of antibiotic really, um, of antibiotic production really led to some of the uh, changes and benefits that we found antibiotics to be used for. So, this production enabled early antibiotic use. And by World War II, we had enough penicillin made that we could send it to the war front and it was advertised as something that saved a ton of soldiers' lives, which was not an overstatement because it really did. Um, having penicillin allowed a lot of soldiers to survive wounds that would previously have been lethal due to infections like gangrene. And there was such an excess of antibiotics that we also began to market them as over-the-counter drugs as you see here on the right, are just really pictures of what antibiotics would look like um, marketed over the counter. So the period from roughly 1940 to 1962 was known as the golden age of antibiotics. Part of the reason was that we discovered many, many new types of antibiotics. You do not need to worry about the names here on this slide. If you want to read them, they can be kind of funny to read. And I don't know how we came up with the names for all of these antibiotics but we found many of the antibiotics that we now use today between 1940 and 1962. In part, uh, along with defining them, we also found all the ways to use them. And so the golden age of antibiotics also included advances in medicine like joint replacements, um, in organ transplants and chemotherapy, and also the benefits to agriculture that I mentioned earlier, like increasing the growth of livestock and protecting crops. So this is the golden age of antibiotics and it was really great and we just kept finding new antibiotics and using them and finding new ways that antibiotics could improve our lives. 
However, remember that microbes respond to antibiotics with antibiotic resistance. Every time that we're using antibiotics, we're exerting selective pressure. So this cycle, this, uh, in this figure that I showed earlier is really playing out every time we use antibiotics. You start with something that is susceptible, add the antibiotic, and eventually you end up with a population that's resistant. So this is what it looks like um, when we are uh, treating, or this is the result of that when we've used antibiotics all the time. So this is just showing an increasing burden of resistance. Um, the more microbes we find that are resistant, the more um, burden that places on our um, health systems and economy. So this is showing here on, uh, on the top where an antibiotic is introduced and then on the bottom where we first observe resistance. So as you can see for penicillin, we observe resistance very soon after it was introduced. And this happens repeatedly for every antibiotic that we find over time, such that the cumulative burden increases. So another way we might depict that is just by picking one type of microbe and seeing how often we isolate um, resistant variants of that microbe. So um, here on the left would be the first time we started isolating it. And then as we isolate more and more, you see that the percentage of the microbes that we're finding are um, much more, the percentage of microbes we're finding that are resistant continues to increase over time. So with this, I also wanna explain a little bit about how we test for antibiotic susceptibility. Every time we're picking out those isolates and determining if they are resistant, um, researchers are performing many types of tests in a lab. And so this is one of them. It starts with a Petri dish with the media, just like I've described before. And then typically, if you would add a ton of bacteria to this Petri dish, you would end up with bacterial growth all over it. So instead of adding just a few bacteria so that I get little colonies like I showed before, I would just cover the plate with bacteria and so that when they replicate, the entire plate is covered. Then I might take another Petri dish and put a tiny paper disc with some antibiotics on it in the middle. And now when I add my bacteria and wait for them to grow, there's no growth surrounding the little paper disc. The antibiotic that was in that paper disc seeps into the media of the Petri dish surrounding it, and the bacteria can't grow right there, although they can grow just fine in the rest of the plate. So we apply this principle to test for resistance to many drugs. And as you can see here, there's one Petri dish that has a ton of little paper discs on it, each one containing a different drug. And then we've covered this with bacteria, and you can see that the bacteria can't grow near most of these paper discs. And this is uh, what we would like to see, meaning the bacteria is susceptible to the antibiotics. On the other hand, if we take another bacteria and plate it with the same types of drugs on these paper discs, you can see that this bacterium can grow all the way up to the edge of the paper disc and do this for multiple. So we would call this resistant to multiple of these antibiotics or a multi-drug resistant bacteria. These multi-drug resistant bacteria or microbes have been called superbugs or microbes resistant to multiple antibiotics. It's not a technical term, but it is a term that is used relatively frequently in uh, media about antibiotic resistance. And finding all of these multi-drug resistant microbes or even microbes that are resistant to a single microbe, but finding more of them is what we call the antibiotic resistance crisis. It's meaning that more and more of the microbes in our environment are resistant to the antibiotics that we've come to rely on. And some really important uh, information, statistics about this would be that more than 2.0 million antibiotic infections currently occur in the US each year. And from these infections, there are almost 36,000 deaths from uh, antibiotic resistant infections. Globally, there are 700,000 uh, deaths from multi-drug resistant infections. And these statistics are really only expected to increase with our current um, antibiotic usage and current uh, rise in resistance. So what are specific causes of this antibiotic resistance crisis? I will give some more information about these, but to overview, to give an overview first, um, there's the overuse and misuse of antibiotics. There's rapid spread of antibiotic resistance when it does develop and we're seeing reduced development of new antibiotics. 
So first, the overuse and misuse of antibiotics. Often antibiotics can be prescribed inappropriately. Um, physicians might prescribe antibiotics to appease patients rather than um, to truly treat a disease. And the antibiotics might be prescribed to treat the wrong kind of infection. Up to 50% of the outpatient antibiotic use may actually be unnecessary. And we also use overuse antibiotics because consumers can purchase over-the-counter antibiotics and may not be purchasing them for the appropriate uh, causes or using them in the appropriate ways. Furthermore, there is overuse and misuse of antibiotics in agriculture. Over 80% of the antibiotics used in the U.S. are used in agriculture just to healthy fatten it to fatten healthy animals and prevent the infections because we house the animals in poor living conditions. So this is a massive component of the antibiotic use that we are seeing each year or every, each year in the US. In all of these circumstances, when we're using antibiotics, we are promoting resistance by um, creating that selective pressure continuously. And when resistance arises, as I mentioned, it can spread really rapidly. So one way you might picture antibiotic resistance spreading is just from person to person. Just like we spread microbes to each other uh, and spread infections, uh, we can also spread resistant microbes from one of us to another. And as we travel, those microbes are also traveling. So uh, a pathogen that, or bacteria that becomes resistant in India um, and is traveling with someone on a plane will now uh, produce more resistant bacteria here in the United States or wherever the plane travels to. We also have the spread of antibiotic resistance in the food supply. As we treat our animals and uh, food supply with antibiotics, now the microbes that are associated with them are also resistant. So we're no longer being infected with just an E. coli that's present on some lettuce, but now there's resistant E. coli on that lettuce. And along with all this, there's also antibiotic pollution. So we're putting antibiotics in all these places where we want to use them but we're also ending up with antibiotics in all kinds of places where we didn't intend for them to be. So if you use them on a farm, antibiotics now end up in the runoff. And now all of the microbes that are exposed to that runoff are now resistant. You also end up with antibiotic pollution from factories that are producing um, various goods and using antibiotics. And just like there might be pollution from other waste, the antibiotics are part of that um, pollution. So lastly, or there's also rapid spread of antibiotic resistance at the molecular level. So microbes are pretty interesting and unlike us, they can directly share genetic information with each other. So if you take a population of susceptible bacteria and you introduce a single resistant bacterium, they have special techniques where they can give DNA to each other. And now that DNA might be encoding the ability for a bacterium to be resistant. So you start with a susceptible population and you end up with a resistant population who may never have ever been exposed to the antibiotics. And compounding all of these uh, issues with the overuse and misuse or uh, rapid spread of antibiotic resistance, we're not really um, having any new development of antibiotics. So previously I showed you this figure up to 1980 where from 1940 to 1960, and even close to 1980, we were still discovering a lot of antibiotics. Since 1990 and progressing into today, we really haven't seen the development of very many um, new antibiotics. So why are fewer antibiotics being discovered? There's a couple of reasons for this. First, it's challenging to discover and design new antibiotics. In order for an antibiotic to really be effective, it needs to um, target the microbes in a way that a previous antibiotic hasn't. If you imagine um, an antibiotic that targets the cell wall, if a microbe comes up with a way to block out one antibiotic from targeting its cell wall, it may also be able to block out another similar antibiotic. So we need to find things that are really new, and that's kind of hard to do. We've kind of already found all the low-hanging fruits of uh, antibiotics. There's also a lack of funding and financial incentive to develop antibiotics. Um, it's high risk to make to find antibiotics because resistance can develop and then any hope of profit is um, gone. And antibiotics are also really short-term courses of treatment. So while some companies might develop drugs that you will become a consumer of for the rest of your life, you are probably only going to take antibiotics for a week or two weeks 
and the company doesn't have a long-term customer. So there's not a lot of way to make products, uh, to make profit from developing antibiotics. A lot of companies who have been trying to develop new antibiotics have actually declared bankruptcy. And lastly, there are also a ton of regulatory barriers that only make the first two parts of this issue even harder. Um, it takes a long time to get a drug made and purified and then go through all the necessary testing so that you're even allowed to begin to sell it. Um, and it can take many years to bring a drug to market. So just to picture this a little bit uh, in a little bit more detail, you might discover an antibiotic here on the left of the graph and spend years researching it and figuring out how it works. Let's just say optimistically that takes five years. Then you finally get to do some clinical research, which would include testing animals and starting to test in humans. And finally, maybe getting um, approval to begin selling it. Then finally, somewhere between 10 and 15 years after you found the antibiotic, you are able to begin selling it. And because antibiotics are a short-term course of treatment, you don't make a lot of profit rapidly. You won't really make profit for many, many years after that. And once you do, it kind of plateaus. And this is the best case scenario because if resistance develops somewhere before this profit, um, profit point, you will see a plateau in this graph a lot sooner. And so it's really not financially um, a good idea for companies to invest a lot in um, developing antibiotics, which is why we're seeing reduced development. So to summarize part two, the discovery of antibiotics revolutionized healthcare. Antibiotic usage causes antibiotic resistance to develop, and we currently face an antibiotic resistance crisis. So now I'll take any questions for part two. Thanks very much, Molly. Uh, that was great. Um, we do have a question from the audience on YouTube, uh, a question from Jessica. She's asking, are there any hypotheses floating around about why antibiotics make livestock bigger? Like, uh, is it microbiome related, mitochondrial stress, or maybe something else? I am not aware of any specific hypotheses. I mean, I would, they could act something like a growth factor depending on the actual biochemistry there, but I don't know of any specific hypotheses. I don't think we really understand that. Perfect. Um, we have another question um, from Jan from our Zoom audience. If a bacteria has a mutation that makes it insensitive to previous antibiotics, can we modify the previous drug to match the mutant target protein? For example, if the active site of a protein mutates so it no longer binds to the previous drug, can we alter the drug just a bit so that it fits into the new active center? So we can do that, but the problem would be to um, find a way to know what changes are happening. It takes a lot of research to know how a protein's active site has actually been changed so that the antibiotic molecule can no longer bind it. And there's only so many ways in which that can happen, but it's really hard to find them and then change that protein or change the drug. Um, it, yeah, it's not that straightforward. It's not as pretty as, you, as the graphics you've shown us today. <laughs> no, definitely not. Perfect. Any other questions from any of our audience anywhere? Um, we do have one question. Do you want to take one before you get started for the third section, Molly? Sure. Yeah, it's Uncle Greg from New Jersey. Um, <laughs> so do you think the advancements in cell or gene therapy will potentially be able to address antibiotic resistance? Uh, I wouldn't rule it out, but I don't think it's um, a promising alternative right now. I think uh, I'm going to discuss some other things that we're looking into but I think those are more of, um, we don't necessarily want to modify the genomes of the organisms that are being affected by microbes. So we probably wouldn't address that. Thank you. I have another one. Okay. Um, is all E. coli now resistant to penicillin or does the lack of selective pressure because of the past resistance and now decreased use in, make it enough to make that resistance unnecessary? So can we use older drugs? Yeah, so that's 
something um, that we are hoping will work out. It's not uh, something we can currently do yet. I don't think the resist the level of resistance has dropped low enough. Um, but there, are, it's not to say that every microbe out there is resistant to antibiotics. There's just a lot of them and enough of them that becomes really difficult to treat some infections. Perfect. I think we can get started in section two. Again, feel free to keep asking questions in the chat and we'll ask it at the very end. All right. So like I mentioned, part three is going to be the future of antibiotics. And we will discuss some ways we are uh, working on combating this antibiotic resistance. So for this section, we'll cover what happens if no changes are made to current practices, what changes are being made to combat antibiotic resistance, and how can emerging technology help us combat antibiotic resistance? So first, if no changes are made to current practices, antibiotic usage will continue to increase. And so just the statistic that antibiotic use in food production alone would increase by 50 to 60 percent um, by 2030 is a significant number, knowing that 80 percent of the antibiotics we use are actually used in food production. So just thinking about that, that's a ton of antibiotic usage in addition to what we're already using. And as we begin to use antibiotics or continue to use antibiotics more, antibiotic resistance will also continue to increase. So we have a couple antibiotics that are on our back shelf as our last resource and resort antibiotics when nothing else works. And as more microbes become resistant to more antibiotics, we're also going to see resistance to these um, even double by 2030. As uh, the resistance increases, the deaths and healthcare costs due to resistant infections will also continue to increase. It takes a lot longer to treat an antibiotic resistant infection and often the backup antibiotics are um, more expensive. So the cost of treating resistant infections is a lot higher. And we know how much of a problem cancer is and how much of an economic impact that has. Antibiotic resistance is suspect, expected to surpass this by 2050. And lastly, if we don't make any changes to our current practices, fewer than one new antibiotic will be, per year will become available. And what we would call the cumulative effect of all of these is the post-antibiotic era. And so in this post-antibiotic era, we would lose all of the advances we've had to medicine, like our surgeries, like C-sections or your joint replacements and organ transplants. We would lose the ability to safely rely on chemotherapy and we would lose all the benefits to agriculture that I've mentioned. In the post-antibiotic era, you would also see an increase in antibiotic resistant deaths. It's predicted to be more than 317,000 just in North America, which would include the US by 2050. And for comparison, right now, this is only about 34,000. And these are yearly deaths. On the global scale, this is gonna account for 10 million deaths per year. And with all of these, I also wanna depict what the economic consequences would look like. So this is depicted here in GDP or gross domestic product. This is basically just an indicator of the economy and you would like the GDP to be high um, rather than low. And this is showing how much antibiotic resistance is impacting the GDP. Because this blue part, that's the effect of antibiotic resistance is going down, that means that there's a negative impact on the GDP. So right now we see this really tiny impact on our economy from antibiotic resistance. By 2050, there will be a loss of $100.2 trillion uh, in GDP per year. So suffice to say, that's a pretty significant impact on the economy. Just to detail a little bit more, the increased healthcare costs mean that there's $10,000 to $40,000 more of, uh, per treatment for an antibiotic resistant infection, including just using different drugs or having a longer um, treatment stay. And the economic, costs also, or economic loss also comes from the loss of the benefits to agriculture. So as much as using all of these drugs in agriculture is really part of the problem, it's also a significant com component to our economic system as it relies or to the economics of agriculture. And if we were to lose all of the ability to use antibiotics in those ways, there'd be decreased output from agriculture and we uh, changes to farming. And further, just to describe the re reduced development of new antibiotics, I mentioned before the discovery void which began in the early 1990s. And this would ex be expected to just continue to infinity. If we don't make any changes to that system, 
there's not going to be any more benefit to uh, developing antibiotics. So now that I've told you all of the negative things and doomsday predictions of what the post-antibiotic era could look like, I also wanna discuss some of the changes that could help us prevent this. So firstly, we can just prevent infections. Preventing infections really prevents, uh, protects everyone. A, the less chance you have of getting an infection, the less chance you have of being infected with a resistant microbe, the less chance, uh, reasons we have to use antibiotics. And you can easily prevent infections as you're probably familiar with right now uh, by using good hygiene and getting vaccinated when there are vaccines available. We can also regulate antibiotic usage in agriculture. So if we require oversight for the antibiotic use uh, so that it's only used to treat animals that are really sick, or we only use antibiotics that aren't going to also be used in humans, we can reduce the amount of resistance that's developed in agriculture such that it um, affects medicine or prevent the development of resistance that would affect medicine. We can also improve the monitoring and tracking of antibiotic resistance. If we know what kinds of microbes are resistant in what areas or when resistant infections are occurring, we can come up with ways to design new treatment strategies that are going to prevent resistance from developing further. And define it, uh, defining all of this are antibiotic stewardship programs. So these are coordinated efforts to use antimicrobials or antibiotics appropriately. And they really provide lots of training for people to prevent infections, guidance for the regulation of antibiotic usage, and an organized system to monitor and track antibiotic resistance. Some global initiatives that include antibiotic stewardship would be the One Health response to antimicrobial resistance. And this is headed by the UN and the WHO or World Health Organization. And the idea here is that everything is connected and we can't just eliminate antibiotic resistance in one area. We need to look at antibiotic resistance that would happen in humans, food and feed, plants and crops, the environment, and also all kinds of animals in the environment. So this is just looking at the idea we need to assess all of these areas together to really come up with a unified response to antibiotic resistance. And at the national level, the CDC has specific initiatives to combat antibiotic resistance. They offer specific antibiotic stewardship training to healthcare organizations and even some uh, just general education programs. They really provide constructive networks to monitor antibiotic resistance um, at a unified national level. And they also help organize funding for innovative solutions to antibiotic resistance. Something they do that could be interesting to all of you listening would be antibiotic resistance threats reports. They produce these every couple, every couple of years and they're available to the public. And they kind of catalog what kinds of microbes are resistant, where they're resistant and the projections for how that resistance is going to change. And they have some really great graphics in these. So I would recommend checking them out. They should be on the handout. Along with the CDC, there's government support at the level of Congress. Congress passed the National Action Plan for Combating Antibiotic Resistance, um, or CARB, and it provides some further national outlines for tracking and data collection about antibiotic resistance, as well as funding for education and all of the CDC initiatives. So the funding is a really critical part of this because antibiotic resistance isn't something we innately set out for the CDC to do. This government support also helps us invest in drug uh, or in new drugs or diagnostics and vaccines. Outside of broad uh, government or international organizations, there are also initiatives specifically at the industry level. So the Keep Antibiotics Working Initiative is help focusing on the use of antibiotics in agriculture. And they want to continue to use antibiotics in agriculture but they want to make sure this is a, sustain, a sustainable practice. So they're stopping the use of antibiotics in healthy animals and focusing on collecting antibiotic data from farms, like how much they're using and what kind of infections they actually have. There's also something called the AMR or Antimicrobial Resistance Industry Alliance. And so this is similar to the Keep Antibiotics Working Initiative, except comprises companies that are um, using antibiotics for production of other goods or else directly develop, working on developing antibiotics and other drugs. And so they're trying to reduce antibiotic pollution and support antibiotic production in a more sustainable way. 
And lastly, a really interesting initiative is called the Nonprofit Model for Antibiotic Development. So I mentioned before all of the financial issues with trying to develop and sell new antibiotics. So the idea is that we can fund these in a nonprofit uh, from nonprofits and these alliances of nonprofit funders and academic institutions can kind of produce antibiotics outside of the previous financial barriers. And so these new networks of research are actually really promising and we've already come up with several drugs that could potentially treat um, mycobacterium tuberculosis through these. So it's great that all of these companies and governments are making these changes, but it's important to note that we can also make changes ourselves um, at the individual level. The CDC has a slogan to be antibiotics aware and smart use and best care. So while you might not think of yourself as a frequent antibiotic user, you're not prescribing antibiotics and you might not be treating any of your own livestock with them, there are changes you can make. So first, as I mentioned, preventing infections is really a great way to reduce our need for antibiotic usage or reduce the issues associated with antibiotic resistance. So you can do your best to stay healthy and keep others healthy. Second, you can use antibiotics properly when you are in possession of them. If you go to the physician and you're sick, don't demand antibiotics. Doctors really will feel, feel pressured to prescribe antibiotics just to um, mentally or help a patient mentally alleviate the symptoms and feel like they're having um, their thoughts, their infection treated. However, not, antibiotics will not treat every infection that you may have. Secondly, you need to take your antibiotic prescriptions when prescribed exactly as the doctor instructs you. Don't save your antibiotics and ask how to safely dispose of the leftovers. Don't become a contributor to the antibiotic pollution that we were, I mentioned. And lastly, don't share your antibiotics with others or take someone else's antibiotic. Again, antibiotics are meant to target specific microbes in specific ways and just spreading them around um, is spreading the resistance, spreading the opportunity for resistance without the benefits of the actual antibiotics. You can also choose healthcare facilities that have antibiotic stewardship programs. They're investing in making smart choices and contributing to data collection about antibiotics. So you can support them by choosing these facilities over facilities that are not promoting antibiotic stewardship. And similarly, you can support antibiotic free food production. These agricultural groups are going to be at an economic disadvantage because they're not using antibiotics as growth enhancers and therefore um, their output might be a little bit lower than the farms um, or groups that are using antibiotics as growth enhancers. And lastly, you should prepare food especially safely, knowing that there are all these resistant microbes around, the risk of being infected uh, with a microbe that could cause food poisoning is just a little bit higher because it could be a little bit harder to treat it. So now I'm gonna talk about uh, the exciting portion of antibiotic resistance crisis. We have a problem, there's antibiotic resistance, but that's an opportunity for a ton of new research to develop solutions to this antibiotic resistance. So here I'm depicting bacteriophages, polymers, and nanoparticles. And I'm gonna explain a little bit more about how these work in the next couple slides. So bacteriophages are a type of virus that specifically infects bacteria. And the bacteriophage is this little um, spaceship looking thing that's attaching to the bacterium here in the top left corner. And when the bacteriophage attaches to the bacterium, it enters the bacteria and begins to replicate. So as you can see here in the picture on the right, after the bacteriophage has entered, it replicates and there are tons of bacteriophages. The bacteriophage then lyses the bacterial cell and all those new bacteriophages go on to infect new bacteria. So what's nice here is that the bacteriophages are viruses. And so they have DNA that can change just like the bacterial DNA. And as a bacteria might develop resistance to a bacteriophage, the bacteriophage can also develop a new mechanism to infect the bacteria. So it's, there's really hope that bacteriophages can help us keep bacterial populations under control. Um, furthermore, bacteriophages are really specific for the type of bacteria they're going to infect. So you know that you have lots of good microbes in your gut and you don't wanna kill them if you take antibiotics. If we use a bacteriophage, we can specifically target a microbe that is causing an infection. So these are the good things about bacteriophages, but why aren't we using them already? Well, first, 
while the ability of a bacteriophage to change is a good thing, it's also kind of a bad or scary thing. Think of it like adding an invasive species to a new environment. Uh, we don't really know what will happen when we add a bacteriophage to an environment and resistance develops or when we're artificially manipulating this system. We don't wanna just go throwing around bacteriophages everywhere when we don't really know what's going to happen yet. So this is something a lot of scientists are working on, but we're not quite ready to use it um, on a large scale yet. The second new technology that's being developed is called an antimicrobial polymer. So similar to the antibiotics that I talked about that are physically damaging the bacterial cell, antimicrobial poly polymers are also damaging the cell wall and also lead to lysis. What's unique here is that they work really rapidly and it's really difficult for bacteria to develop resistance to these. So again, this is great, but why aren't we using them already? They're a lot harder produ to produce than our typical antibiotics that we're used to producing. And so there are some issues with scaling up the production of these uh, antimicrobial polymers and properly delivering them during infection. Lastly, there are also antimicrobial nanoparticles. So nanoparticles are really just extremely small molecules. And so there are sometimes just a few atoms. And there are a couple we know of that have antimicrobial activities. So nanoparticles are depicted here by this lightning bolt and these um, ions or plus and minus signs here. And they're, this is not a great description, but they're kind of mysterious to scientists too. We don't really know how they work, but we do know that they can lead to DNA damage or impaired cellular function or impaired function of cellular machines. And this is ultimately lethal. It's also really difficult for the bacteria to develop resistance to these because they're so small and they're usually composed of atoms that bacteria need to use all the time anyway. So the bacteria can't really eliminate something that it needs all the time. So it's difficult for resistance to develop to nanoparticles, making them a promising um, possible solution to antibiotic resistance. And so why aren't we using these already? Well, like I mentioned, we don't really know how they are, how they work. And we know there are some effects on human cells that we don't know about yet. So they're not exactly the same as antibiotics and we can't just substitute them. So in summary of part three, if no changes are made to current practices, we face a post-antibiotic era. Public health, industry, and government organizations are collaborating to combat resistance and emerging technologies can offer some alternatives to antibiotics. So now I'll take questions for part three or just the whole talk. Thank you, Molly. Um, we'll wait a little bit for questions. Also, um, we had some issues. So YouTube went down uh, completely in the world. So I, I saw that some of our viewers that were on YouTube hopped onto the Zoom. So thank you for doing that. Um, but the whole thing is recorded and it will be posted on our uh, YouTube webpage. So if there are parts that you missed, you could probably look at that. There. So we apologize if you had that little mishap, but YouTube is still down everywhere. Um, so now does anybody have any follow-up questions? Anything like that? Okay, one. How do people deliver phages to patients? So that's another reason we're not quite using them yet. We don't really have a good way to deliver them. The phages may not survive as well in our um, like digestive tract, tract as an antibiotic might. And I don't think we've experimented yet with trying to in inject them. So it is a another challenge to using phages. One more from Jan. Do the polymers elicit immune response? Uh, yes, they could very, they could. Um, I don't know any specific examples of that, but a lot of molecules that we are trying to use to in place of antibiotics actually have immune consequences. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for attending. I really enjoyed the opportunity to share a little bit about microbiology and antibiotics with you. And if you have further questions, you can always email um, sitnboston at gmail.com. That will be on our, that's on our webpage as well. And we would love to hear. Yes. If you can fill the field feedback survey that I posted in the chat, we would appreciate that. And our next lecture is on December 2nd. It'll be about COVID and vaccines. Thank you so much for joining us this evening.